welcome. So this is our Tuesday monthly learning session, Jan 16th. Um, and today's focus is on government and uh, public services. So um, today we have June Reyes from the city of Portland. We have Kristen Brown from 311. We have Amparo Agosto from TriMet. And we have a couple folks from the Water Bureau. We have Matt Weatherly, Penny Milton, and Kenny Scott. We'll be talking about water quality, efficiency, and leak repair, and financial assistance. So a lot of government uh, programs and public services. So um, to start, we will have June. June, are you on? Oh, I see you. Awesome. Great. June, we'll let you take it away. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Thanks, everyone. Um, my name is June Reyes. Um, I work on the city of Portland's transition team. Um, and um, I will also just wanted to mention that James Valdez is also here, who will be giving a short presentation on the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And so really, we try to think of resources that would be great to share with um, community-based organizations in the Portland area. And so I'll go over the city transition update. Um, and then um, kind of pause for questions if folks have any, and then I'll hand it over to, um, to James. So thanks again, everyone, for being here. I know today is probably one of those more challenging days to show up to work. And so um, just major appreciation for y'all listening and, and being here. Um, and so again, um, I work for the city's transition team. So um, um, helping us to, tra to transition to a different form of government and election methods. Um, and why I'm here, why I think it's um, important to share this information with you is um, for folks living or working in Portland, how advocacy might happen could be a little bit, bit different, how the government systems you um, talk to and organize with, or um, that, that, that might be a little bit different, and really how your voice is going to be heard through elections, elected officials, um, different districts, uh, ranked choice voting, so how you will um, select elected leaders, it's going to be different. And so we're all learning, we're doing something new. Um, and this is, you know, because of November 22, 2022, charter amendments that were approved that essentially really told us that Portlanders want a more inclusive, participatory, and effective government. And so these are some big but exciting changes coming to the city. And so first, I wanted to talk about what's what it's like today and then what it's going to be like in the future which is actually pretty close it's january 1st 2025. so right now in the city of portland um we choose one candidate uh when we when we uh vote and in the future starting november 2024 so this november election we'll be ranking candidates so then you can express your preferences on the ballot um using ranked choice voting and i'll go into more information about that in a little bit the second is um, we used to have citywide elections. So city um, Portland commissioners could be from anywhere in the city. And we were really voting based as basically one big district together. But we've noticed that, for example, East Portland has been hasn't had as much investment as, say, other parts of Portland, like the west side or the inner um, parts of Portland. And so we've now split into four geographic districts where we'll have three city councilors each. And so that will hopefully make our government more reflective and inclusive of the needs of the entire entirety of Portland. And the third is replacing a commission form of government with a city council that focuses on setting policy and a mayor that's elected citywide to run city day-to-day -day operations. So I'll get a little bit more into what that means for you all, um, but I just really wanted to highlight these three main changes that are hopefully going to make our government accountable, transparent, efficient, and effective. So to change to transition our form of government, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and I just wanted to put up here some things that we've already finished and done. So for example, we've established the four geographic districts. Um, we've established salaries for elected officials, and we've established council operations. So how is a new council going to operate? The things that we still have left to do um, up until January 1st, 2025, is having our first election using ranked choice voting, um, educating voters and candidates. It's going to be everybody's first time using this form of voting. So we want to make sure folks are knowing how to do this uh, right. And they're really expressing their preferences correctly. 
And then the other pieces that are happening are, you know, we're going to have a new budget process for the city um, that is more efficient. And then we're going to be right now, city hall is being renovated because we're going from five to 12 city councilors. There's a lot of city code that needs to be rewritten. We'll also have this big, um, uh, a big recruitment happening for a city administrator who's going to run the day-to-day -day operations of the city. And lastly, it's going to be a chance to improve um, the, the services that the city of Portland is providing because one of the things that's happening is we're kind of reorganizing the city so that the structures are, we're actually more incentivized to collaborate with each other than maybe do things on our own. So I wanted to just show you all really quick the city of Portland district plan map. So um, every so these are established. So you'll see that on the most eastern side is district one, north northeast is district two, the southeast is district three, and district four is on the west side. And so um, in this November, we'll be voting for all of our elected or all of our um, councilors, our mayor, and our city auditor. And um, I think it's just, I just want to mention that District 1 and 2 will be electing our counselors for four-year terms. And then we'll be elect, because we'll be electing um, Districts 3 and 4, we want to have a sort of staggered approach to electing. So those will be, um, their, their first term will be for two years. And the reason why that's happening is because District 1 and District 2 have traditionally had lower voter turnout. And so we are hoping that we can kind of um, boost voter turnout in those districts by having um, presidential years where folks are voting. And so what that also means is that we're no longer going to have, for the city of Portland, we're no longer going to need primary races. We're going to be using ranked choice voting and putting all those candidates on the ballot um, and eliminating the need for a primary. And so whether we're voting for mayor or we're voting for our city councilors, our ballot is going to look the same. And so what you'll see on your ballot is you'll have a list of candidates, maybe you'll have a dozen um, listed there, but you can rank up to six. And so each vote, um, and so you can rank any of the six, you can choose to maybe rank three or four, that's up to you. Um, but this is what you can expect what your ballot will look like. And something in particular for CBOs I wanted to highlight is that voter education, again, as like I said, is going to be huge because it's going to be the first time the city of Portland is going to be utilizing ranked choice voting. Um, and so we're not only going to use utilize utilize existing channels and do candidate education, but we also are going to have we also have this partnership with the United Way, the Columbia Willamette, to um, reach hard to reach voters. And so we'll be coming up with nonpartisan materials and having some paid media. But a big piece of this, I'm hoping you all um, will take a look at, is there will be sub grants for direct voter contact events and communication. So that RFP will be rolling out in spring. And I'm happy to talk to anyone um, about what that might look like or what might be expected, because we want to really make sure that priority populations, those who have, you know, been left out of this conversation, um, have access to these materials. And so um, I have in the last couple slides here, um, I just want to share a couple more things. One is that everything we'll have regarding the election will be on portland.gov slash vote 2024. Um, and then and then I think this is the last sort of big substantive update I wanted to provide you all is um, this is this is kind of a big complicated sort of city organization structure kind of sheet, but I think it's what's important to get here is that the way that we're being organized is we're being organized by what we're calling service areas. So we have budget and finance, city operations, community and economic development, public safety, vibrant communities and public works. And why that's significant is that what this does, this these groupings, they allow us to work together. Um, we'll be, for example, we'll be coming up with budgets together as a service area and then submitting those. Um, and then submitting that to a city administrator, not an elected official. And so um, we're hoping that some of these bigger changes that are coming to the city make it so that we have those blocks and pieces in place to then enable the folks who are working with the city to collaborate better with you all and to be able to make things more efficient and to fix things that aren't working. Um, and so hopefully this, we're hoping that this new structure, you know, it's gonna take some time to get there, 
but at least we have that enabling environment to 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 be able to serve the city of Portland and uh, work with community-based organizations better. And then, um, yeah, so we're looking forward to a lot of new things in 2024. Um, like I said, launching those new voter um, candidate education campaigns. And really the thing I wanted to highlight is really introducing Portlanders to their new form of government and um, how to access the services they need. And so we'll send this um, over to you all as part of the follow-up materials, but um, you know, we have a presentation that we can provide just on ranked choice voting or more on the city government. Um, we go to probably, I don't know, between 10 to 15 organizations a month talking about this. And so we're happy to come to your organization and talk to folks more about our, this transition to um, a different form of government, new voting methods using ranked choice voting. Um, because it's really important that to let Portlanders know that their voice really matters, um, in, especially in this new form of government. So I will pause for um, a couple questions if folks have any, and if not, then I can also just pass it over to my colleague, James. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? Oh, I see. I had one, June. Um, I know that we talked about the um, procurement and that that individual wasn't able to present today. Um, do you know if there will be a singular place for CBOs to go to apply for um, for grants or or funding and or RFPs, any of that? Is it a singular location? So um, I guess it all kind of depends right now. And I think what I'm hearing is there have been challenges to be able to hear about what are the different RFPs coming out and how do we like uh, find these. And so um, I think currently, uh, I guess that that's a, that, I guess I feel like I understand the question. I don't know the answer. And um, that's something that I can send over to our procurement folks and hopefully in our fault materials, get the answer to you. That would be great. Thank you so much. Any other questions for June? All right, thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, I also have James' presentation in here that I'm sharing, so I can, uh, I can hand it over to him. All right, thank you, June. And uh, thank you all. Great to be with you here today. And I know it is a challenge, it's been a challenging few days and some more weather to come. So, yeah, I hope everybody stays safe. Uh, my name is James Valdez, he, him pronouns, and I work for the City of Portland's Bureau of Planning and Sustainability on the Portland Clean Energy Community Benefits Fund which we're just gonna abbreviate to PCEF or Portland Clean Energy Fund. Um, and I just have a few slides uh, and kind of content in this, but I wanted to just really share, you know, maybe in the spirit of the previous question about funding opportunities and resources, I want to share some really important um, opportunities for you all as community-based organizations uh, to be aware of within the Portland Clean Energy Fund, um, as we do have an open, RFP or an open opportunity right now uh, for about a, a little bit uh, less than a month. And so I'm going to walk through a little bit of what the Portland Clean Energy Fund is at a very high level. Uh, I only have a, about five minutes, so I can't get into all the details, um, but I wanted to just highlight both what the opportunity is, some of the categories of funding, um, and the timeline. So we'll go ahead and get to the next uh, slide here, June. So um, Portland Clean Energy Fund really came about, you know, through amazing work by community organizations who recognized that there was a need for resources, um, especially for organizations that serve people of color and low income communities to be able to participate more actively in climate work um, to address both, you know, the, the coming hazards of climate, including some that we're seeing right now, um, as well as make, making sure that we have tools to be able to uh, equitably serve the community and to address racial and social justice in, in our work. And so a ballot measure was put together by a huge range of community organizations um, back in 2017, 2018. And on uh, November 2018, uh, speaking like June was about voting, <laughs> Portland voters voted for this overwhelmingly. Um, over 65% of Portlanders voted to make this real. And over the last few years, we've been making it real. Um, the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability was tasked with standing up the program, 
And uh, right now we have over a hundred different organizations doing work that's uh, grant funded through PCEF, um, reflecting over $120 million worth of expenditures. And the money comes from, and so maybe just to back up a little bit about, about this. So the Bowd Initiative created a funding mechanism and then a funding pathway. Um, the funding mechanism is a 1% surcharge, a very small amount on large corporations that do business within Portland. And there's exemptions for things like, you know, medicine and food and the necessities of life. Um, but it turns out that that 1% of, uh, of, of re total retail sales generates a lot of revenue. And so we've been able to do over $120 million worth of grant making, and we have a lot more funding to come, as you might have seen in some of the news over the last, um, over the last few, few months and even over the last couple of years. So we'll go to the next slide where we'll talk about kind of what's next. Um, so through an amazing about year long process um, that happened throughout the most of 2023, we were able to come together and get community input on something called the Climate Investment Plan, which is our plan going forward for the next five years of allocating funding within the Portland Clean Energy Fund. And that total amount of money is significant. It's $750 million over the next five years. And so we have a whole range of both what we are calling strategic programs, which are kind of targeted programs with outcomes um, where there will also be opportunities for nonprofits to play a role in some of those. Um, and those include uh, programs around home energy retrofits and um, doing multifamily housing, um, programs around uh, improvements on 82nd Avenue, programs around an e-bike uh, rebate that, that will launch, um, funding for resilience, uh, for increasing resilience of, of community uh, spaces, a whole range of programs. And I encourage you, um, I'll drop a link to look at the Climate Investment Plan. And then we also have what has been kind of the, the base of, our, of the Portland Clean Energy Fund, which is a community responsive grant program. And so this is a program that allows nonprofit organizations and community-based organizations to propose ideas that have both a climate and a social racial equity lens and put them forward as their ideas of what they want to see happen. And then there's a process to evaluate those. And so that community responsive grant program is what has happened twice so far, and we're now in the third round, and that's open right now. And so we'll go ahead and get to the next slide. And so the Climate Investment Plan kind of put forward the framework um, and the code also kind of that, that voters passed uh, defines what eligible entities are. So I just wanna be clear about kind of who can apply. And so you do have to be a nonprofit organization to apply for a community responsive grant. Um, and these kind of are the, the requirements that so you have to be registered um, with the federal government as a 501C organization and also with the Oregon Secretary of State. However, we really do want to make sure, and it's in the you know core ethos and values of PCEF, to be able to support small organizations that are not yet nonprofits. And so we do allow for fiscal sponsor sponsorship or um, kind of a co-partnership between a community-based organization that might not have a federal status yet and a nonprofit organization who does. So that fiscal sponsorship is something that we definitely uh, promote and and uh, welcome applications that have that partnership. Uh, also, just to to maybe name one piece, your organization, if you're interested in PCEF, does not need to be located in Portland. However, you do your project does have to be located in Portland, or if it's a workforce development uh, related pr uh, project or program, it has to be within the Portland metro area. And so, just wanted to kind of put that framework out there. Um, the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about, bit about what funding is available in different categories and a little bit of what, the, what, a, what some of those categories are. And so what you see on the left here is the amount of funding that was allocated in the, clim in the climate investment plan over a total of five years and then for that funding area. And then what you see on the right is how much is available in this particular allocation or this open period for community responsive grants. And so what you'll see is the, the majority of the funding is really in energy efficiency and renewable energy or kind of clean energy. So this is really improving people's buildings. Um, this can be either people's homes, you know, as we know right now, um, I know my home, even though uh, I do, I'm lucky to have heat, it's still very cold and I need a lot more insulation. <laughs> 
Um, and that's the case with a lot of people's homes all over all over the city. And so this this funding can be used to either improve uh, people's homes in, the, in apartments or single family homes, or also to help improve the energy efficiency, resili re resiliency, and renewable energy systems of nonprofit spaces themselves. So if you manage a space within Portland, if you're either a, a tenant or if you own a building, there's opportunities to improve the building that you that you occupy. Also, transportation decarbonization. So this is opportunities to help people get around the city um, with without using you know fossil fuel vehicles. So this can be um, for nonprofit organizations to get an electric vehicle fleet for e-bikes or for e-bike lending libraries out in the community or for other innovative ideas that help um, people reduce their dependence on, on gas and diesel and getting around, getting around the city. Workforce and contractor development is also a core piece of PSEP work to ensure that we're diversifying the range of people who have access to jobs in clean energy. And so the, these can be a range of programs focused on uh, apprenticeship development, job training, um, kind of early job skills development, as well as um, training and, and education resources in different trades. And so we have, as you see, five to $7 million uh, dedicated to that. It does have to have a connection though to climate related work, to, to job pathways that have a connection to either energy efficiency or decar transportation decarbonization or some of these other areas. We also, oh, and thank you, June, for, for dropping those links in. <laughs> um, then we also have a fun, funding area for regenerative agriculture. This is to in increase the amount of food uh, that's grown locally here within Portland and distributing that food to, to people who need it the most. And so this is opportunities for um, basically acquiring uh, land or you know lease, leasing land, as well as the improvements needed to, to, to farm or to have the equipment needed um, or to the food distribution network. Then we have a green infrastructure funding area. This is for projects that um, are involved with uh, things like tree planting or, or deep paving, um, planting shrubs and, and uh, native plants, things like that, that help make our green, literally our green infrastructure, the things that are growing around our city um, that help sequester carbon and also help with stormwater. Then we have a, a small allocation about five, about $400,000 for other climate projects that don't fit nicely within these categories, but are sort of innovative or that have um, elements of addressing the climate challenge and social and racial equity, um, but don't, again, don't fit into those. And so, um, yeah, we, we have a, a lot of resources to put out in the community and we've had an open uh, application period for a little over a month. And I just want to go over the time frame of what what's next. If you're interested in this, I just want to let you know there is still time to apply. Um, we opened the application in about November twenty of uh, November twenty ninth of of last year, and we do have a lot of info session information and um, videos you can watch on our on our website. Um, they're they're in the links that that June sent, and I'll maybe add a couple more direct links, um, but. The process is where everything goes through an online web portal to apply. And so it's called Web Grants, um, and it's a citywide platform that's now being used for a lot of grant applications. So I, you know, maybe to previous question, this is also an opportunity for people to get familiar with this Web Grants tool and platform because other grants in the city will also be going through this in the future. And we have uh, applications open until February 15th, so about a month left. And we also have, I want to say, uh, technical assistance and office hours that will be available through the next about three weeks or so for applicants if you're interested in um, kind of asking questions of staff or learning a little bit more, kind of getting either uh, technical questions answered about how, how a project might fit into different funding categories, we can't help you write the application, um, but we can provide some guidance. And so um, we just to kind of let people know a sense of when the funding will actually be available. Um, we have a review process that will go through uh, late May or early June in terms of evaluating the process. We also have all the grant scoring criteria online on, on our website, too. So you can know how how your application um, will be evaluated. And then we anticipate awarding funds in the summer. So really June, August, um, 
we need to go to city council to get our kind of pool of grants approved. And so then funding would be available after that. So just to kind of set expectations, uh, it would really be kind of fall 2024 when a project could could first start getting their their con their grant contract uh, documents together, and then you know in that winter that a project could really start. All right, um, I should have actually had more web links on the next slide, which doesn't exist. So um, <laughs> then we're going to three one one. So maybe I'll stop here. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but I did want to make sure I answered some questions if there were some. No problem. Thank you so much, James. This information is so important and timely being that we're just about a month away. So I appreciate yeah. that very much. It looks like Layla has a question. Um, oh, yeah, I, I see. I'm scrolling down. Okay. Um, so Layla's question is, will there be a requirement or incentive for apartment complex owners to upgrade their building to be more energy efficient with the support of your grants? And so the answer is yes. Um, not so much through the grant uh, pathway that we have open right now, though I will say that nonprofit affordable housing providers are definitely eligible to, you know, apply for for grants. Um, but the 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 climate investment plan does have a strategic program focused on multifamily properties, both for regulated affordable housing as well for as for more the broader market, um, along with requirements that those um, investments of funding for energy efficiency aren't used as a as a way to raise rents for people. So um, so the, yes, the answer is that there are incentives that will be available. We're still launching that program and it really won't be until later this year or early 2025 that that, that program is, is live and active. But yeah, and I'm happy to share opportunities about that too when, once it is once it is active. Hey, James, if you could send over that information and I can post it in our weekly newsletter when it's up and active, that would be fantastic. Yeah, okay. yeah I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, and, you know, let me just make one more plug for something which kind of ties into maybe the 311 conversation, which is that we have another program that I didn't cover called Cooling Portland. I know that it's winter time right now and, you know, people are focused on how to stay warm. But we recognize that summertime heat is a major hazard for our communities here in Portland as well, especially given you know the extreme temperatures we've had over the last few years. And so we launched a program called Cooling Portland that helps low-income Portlanders access cooling equipment through these portable cooling units. And to date, um, our community partners have distributed over 7,000 of those out in the community. Um, and we will distribute thousands more um, th this year. And so I'm going to send put a link in, in the chat for that program as well. But I did want to let folks know that if you're a community-based organization that's interested in joining that program as a distribution partner, we will have another open period for, for partners um, in, a, in a couple months. We'll open it up in, in kind of late February to get ready for this, this, uh, this kind of cooling season uh, later on. So um, yeah, I guess that's the last high level <laughs> uh, piece of info I wanted to share, but we have a lot, just generally, we'll have a lot more opportunities coming out through PCEF. And so this question of how we kind of notify or centralize like that opportunity and announcement is a really good one, because I think as a city, we need to do a better job of making those opportunities available and letting people know both the processes and the timeline. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. So we'll stay tuned on that that piece and uh, appreciate all the information you're sharing. This is super helpful and definitely weird to think about cooling right now, but definitely the time to start thinking about it as it comes fast. So, all right. Thanks, James. Okay. Kristen, go for it. thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks, Annie. Um, my name is Kristen Brown. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the communications and outreach coordinator for PDX 311. Uh, I can say I attended a meeting that James hosted with his community partners in that cooling Portland for the cooling Port Portland program. And to hear the feedback from the CBOs that helped uh, distribute cooling units was really awesome and super impactful. And they've got it down like a very well-oiled machine. So it is something that if you reach a lot of folks, um, I would highly recommend jumping on the cooling Portland bandwagon. 
Um, Thanks, Kristen. And I also want to note, you know, just ahead of, ahead of this, that we are working together with some of your staff at 311 to integrate that Cooling Portland program with 311 better. So, <laughs> Trying to make it full circle. Uh, so I'll share with you guys a little bit about what 311 is. You might have already seen some of the advertisement and you might have already heard about it. Um, but kind of want to give you guys a, a behind the scenes peek of what it is and then also how uh, we can share the messaging with our community members about how to use it or what's the best case scenario to use it. June is being my fantastic uh, slide advancer. So if you can click, thank you, June. I wanted to put our vision statement up um, because we are funded by both the the city of Portland and Multnomah County, we created this joint vision to reach community members regardless of language, access, abilities, or resources. And that is something we hold at our heart um, as a resource for community members. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we were providing access to local government as easy as possible. And government is something that is traditionally not uh, thought of as responsive or hasn't been responsive in the past. And so we're really trying to turn the tide in, in that messaging and we're trying to turn the tide and show up for our community members in a very easy, efficient way. You'll proceed to the next slide, thank you. So this is high level, so much information, <laughs> but I'll start off with we launched 311 publicly in the summer of 2022. We have been around as 503-823-4000 for the last 10 or 12 years. So if you needed to reach the county or the city, you could call that 4000 number. You'd reach a staff of about three who could answer questions, bump you somewhere else. Um, but really during the uh, COVID, during COVID, uh, we kind of honed in on, we there needs to be a number for all community members to be able to access to reach local government. And so 311 was formed and shaped um, during COVID. And then, like I said, in 2022, we did, we started our public, marketing campaign and our public launch. Uh, you can dial 311 within Multnomah County and you can reach our staff members. Uh, the city of Vancouver also has a 311. So if you're kind of crossing the bridge, you might get bounced back and forth. We have found that some folks who use VoIP, the voice over internet protocol, cannot use 311 easily. Um, so we're still promoting the 503-823-4000 number. Um, we have gotten calls outside of Multnomah County and our community, our customer service representatives are typically able to help in some capacity and then transfer folks out uh, to where they need to go. We have an email, 311 at portlandoregon.gov. We're also available at cityinfo at portlandoregon.gov. We've got a website online that I will say is not super great, but the great thing about our website is you can go there and request information um, in various languages. We've got resource guides, we've got flyers, we've got pop sockets, we've got this super cool magnet, which is the image you see on the right-hand side of your screen. Our program is open seven days a week, 7 a.m. to 8 p.m., and that was an advancement made last summer. Um, prior to that, we were only open five days a week, and we are not open on uh, federal holidays, so we were closed on Monday, otherwise open seven days a week. We pride ourselves in our ability to uh, help community members out in whatever language they speak. We have access to language resources, and we are trying to share with community members that when you reach 311, you can say the language you wish to speak and then just hold for two to five minutes. Um, some reports that we've gotten is you know, I'll, I'll say I want to speak in a specific language and then there's nothing. 
And what's happening in that nothing time is our call takers are trying to reach out to a folk, to, to an interpreter or to someone who can speak that language. So sometimes it's as quick as 15 seconds, but we say two to five minutes just to set an expectation of wait a little bit, we will get somebody on the line that can help. And right now we have 23 customer service representatives that are taking phone calls. I mean, from up from three in 2020, and now we're up to 20, 23. And, you know, that is a huge testament to our expanding hours, but also our expanding ability to help city programs and also to answer lines for other city phone numbers. So this weekend, if you had a down tree and you called 823 tree, you reached 311 and we were taking the calls, taking the reports and then passing that information along to the urban forestry folks. We also do that with a lot of the PBOT lines, the 823 safe number, 823 bike. <laughs> There's uh, over... I, I don't I don't even want to throw out a number, but there are so many 823 numbers <laughs> that the city has, and they're now being redirected to 311. So that way you get a live person that's answering the phone. And if we can't help you right away, then we know who to bounce the call over to to assist. Um, I want to bring your attention to that graphic on the right hand side of the screen. A tremendous amount of the outreach that I do is really helping folks discern the difference between 911, 211, and 311. And we say 911 is for uh, emergency services. So fire, police, ambulance, Portland Street response. If you need service now, something is actively happening, that is a 911 call. A 211 call is for social services and special things like this weekend, you called 211 to find your shelter, the nearest shelter to get transportation to a shelter. So they're steeped in social services. 311 is local government. So we're talking roads, streets, uh, cooling units. <laughs> That's kind of a one-off. Um, you know, where, uh, what district am I in, uh, in voting? We take a lot of campsite reports as well. Um, and we're just kind of one point of contact for, for local government in general. If you'll advance the slides, June. This is a long and dirty list of things we can help you with and things we can't. But uh, I would just impress upon anyone that if you're not having an emergency, right, that's 911. 311 can really help you with anything else. Um, and if some folks get 311 and 211 confused, it's totally fine. Our call takers will bounce that call over to where it needs to go. And we do get folks call us uh, when they actually do need 911. And we're able to tell the call, the caller to hang up and dial 911 because that'll provide the, the 911 call taker with um, tracking and the ability to see where that caller is at. So folks might sometimes get a little upset that we tell them, I'm sorry, but you need to hang up. Um, but it's it's to really help that person and to help the call taker triage the phone call. Our big hope is that we're helping alleviate calls that are going to 911 that don't need to go to 911. <laughs> um, we know 311 is a, a new number in the community. And so getting it out is super important. So folks know that there is something available to them to use other than 911. Um, maybe let's go to the next slide. So as far as community-based organizations, uh, ways that we can help you guys is, uh, as I said, we have connections to many different languages. So if your community speaks a language other than English, please uh, share that we can assist. Feedback, if you are hearing things like, gosh, the city doesn't do this, or we really wish the city could do this, let us know. Or if if someone's had an issue with 311, please let me know. Our supervisors are constantly listening back to calls 
and refining the knowledge base that our call takers use. So that way we, our call takers can be very quick and very efficient. Um, we're lucky that we're still relatively new and there's no time limit on our calls. So our call takers are really, really trying to get the best information to the folks that are calling in, in other 311s and other cities, um, they, there's kind of like a good time limit for folks to be on the phone with a community member. Uh, and we don't hold that. <laughs> we don't have that right now. We're really just trying to be as effective as possible, as friendly as possible, and as helpful as possible. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was ADA accommodations. Uh, if you're working with folks that need assistance uh, to either participate in a city program or service, our uh, 311 helps process those ADA requests and we're able to help. So feel free to dial 311 or at the bottom of every city website or every city page, there's an accommodation request. You can fill that information out and someone will follow back up with you within about 24 hours. Um, let's see, next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of the amount of calls that we get. We also staff the Portland building front desk. So we're seeing more folks come in and ask questions. And just to give you a, a breakdown as far as uh, receiving phone calls and what those um, what those look like. We, we receive a lot of phone calls about campsites, about abandoned automobiles, um, parking enforcement. November was a big uh, leaf day push. So uh, the street sweepers were out and about and folks had questions. We we're helping answer that. Uh, it kind of varies month to month. In the summer, we're a lot busier. We take a lot more calls in the summer and it kind of uh, dies down in the winter. Although I will say on Saturday, we took over a thousand phone calls and Saturdays and Sundays are typically slow, like around 250 to 300. And I would say 75% of those calls this weekend were, were down trees. So that bar chart's going to look really, really different <laughs> for the month of January. And I think with that, this is just our basic information. Um, are there any questions? It looks like Layla had a question. Uh, with respect to eviction, what support is rendered? Evictions are considered a social service. So I would recommend calling 211 and seeing um, what assistance that they have there. Okay, I'm sorry, this is Layla. So I noticed on your list, you know, when you said 311, these are all the areas that people mm -hmm. can call about. Yeah. Eviction was on that list. Yeah, oh. this one. So it says eviction moratorium. So I was wondering with 311, what is it that you provide? Let me check in on that and double check. Thank you. <laughs> and I was also wondering, since I have, if you don't mind. No. Um, so, uh, and this could be something definitely uh, I'm thinking about the sweep, about the, you know, the homeless camps and somebody calls and they say, I have a campsite here and uh, Portland police comes or the rapid response team comes to do a sweep. Do you, do you just notify them and they do their part, but you have no further connection or information what becomes of those people that are removed, what happens to them? Yeah, our impact response team are the folks that receive the information that we're taking on the phone. And I sure don't want to speak for them. Um, but if I'm remembering correctly, the impact reduction team goes out and does an assessment of the site. And at that time, they are working with um, other resource, uh, other folks who are resources to either relocate someone who's living there, provide them options for sheltering. Um, and it's there. there is a notice that is posted uh, before anything is removed. So it's definitely in tandem with, with someone who has some resources to help folks out if they're living there. 
Okay. Maybe the impact response team might be a, a good speaker for the next go round because they're way more knowledgeable about the processes in place. Oh, please, Annie. <laughs> You're on mute. Sorry, I'm on mute. Um, would that be Portland Street Response or is that a different organization? Different, and they work in tandem with Portland Street Response. It's the Impact Reduction Program. And I can do a email, um, Annie. That Annie, would be fantastic. Annie. Yes. Thank you both so much. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. And Riley, I see your message here. Absolutely. I've got the magnets uh, translated in Spanish too. I'll drop a link uh, where you can fill out a form and let me know what you want and what language you want and where you want it mailed. And I'll, I'll be in the office on Thursday. So I'll get it in the mail on Thursday. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thanks so much for sharing all of this important information and for all of those, uh, June and James and Kristen, just, um, I know that government is going through a lot of transition and there's a lot of questions and there's still a lot of unknowns, um, but I super appreciate all of you being point people to uh, to kind of begin that process and that conversation uh, with this community. So thank you so much. Any last questions for any of them before we move along to TriMet? Okay. Awesome, thank you for being here. All right, Amparo, am I saying that correctly? You are, sorry, I'm trying to unmute myself. Okay. Oh, there we go, <laughs> great. Amparo, thank you so much for being here with TriMet. And um, I know you all have been busy this weekend too. So I uh, appreciate you taking time. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, thank you for having us here today. I really appreciate it. I mainly just wanted to go over some information about our reduced fare resources that we have available for the community. Uh, my name is Amparo Agosto and I'm the manager for community engagement programs here at TriMet. I um, wanted to highlight that our prices um, went up starting in January. Um, last January 1st, our prices increased. So I just wanted to make sure that you all were aware that our monthly fare cap stayed the same. Our two hour, our two and a half hour tickets went up as well as our day passes. Um, however, our monthly fare caps remain the same. So for anyone who travels um, for uh, on a regular basis or on a daily basis, their costs did not increase. Um, the monthly cost for adult fare stayed at $100 per month. And honor citizen, as well as youth, the cost for their monthly fare stayed at $28 a month. Um, the Lyft paratransit service also did see incre an increase in the two and a half hour ticket. However, their monthly cap stayed at $74 per month. Now, um, because we do understand that a lot of folks were concerned about the different ways in, the, in which they would be able to afford the new fare increases, we wanted to make sure that you were all aware that there is the reduced fare program that we, um, that we have on our end. And this is basically an honor citizen card that folks can qualify so that they can get the $28 fare per month as opposed to the $100 per month for the adult fare. Um, there are several ways to qualify. They can qualify based on age, and um, for that, they would need to be 65 years or old or older and apply as a senior citizen. If they want a card that's personalized, they can fill out an application and get that um, via our um, main office at Pioneer Courthouse Square. If they want to, um, if they're able to apply based on income, um, they can also fill out an application, and we are currently holding um, sessions for, for folks to get registered for that. I'll walk through that in a little bit more um, in more detail. Um, and the third option, which is our newest option that was recently added in November of this past year, is um, the service um, active duty members of the military and veterans. So they are now eligible for the reduced fare program as well, or the honor citizen card. Um, so that one is our newest um, addition to, to getting that service on there. Um, so when qualifying based on income, the way that it works is that um, a person can bring um, one of the following to 
um, different locations that we have or they can apply online. They can um, provide a pay stub for the last 30 days. They can also provide an unemployment pay stub or a benefit letter. Um, if they are um, unemployed, they can get a work source um, employment verification letter that they can submit. They can also use their most recent tax returns and um, bring a photo ID with them um, to get registered for that. If they're registering in person at our Pioneer Courthouse Square location, it takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes uh, for English speakers. And I wanna highlight that because when they are non-English speaking, we will need to get an interpreter and it will take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes to get that information um, entered in our system. Once we do that, um, they get a picture taken and they get their honor citizen card there. It gets printed for them so they don't have to come back. And that honor citizen card is good for three years. After three years, they would need to go through the qualification process again to get registered for that card. Now, currently we are offering a $28 um, um, promotion, which is basically a month free after they register. So they can come into our Pioneer Courthouse Square, Square location, get registered for that program, and they would get a month free. Um, depending on where when they get registered, they may get it on the following month. So for instance, um, if someone were to go in during the middle of the month, they probably would not get it until the following month. Um, but they would let them know when they could, uh, they would be getting that free month. Um, for the veterans, um, they now can fill out an application. They do still have to fill out a physical application. Uh, we're currently working on trying to get an application online. So that should be coming in the future. But for right now, they have to fill out a physical copy of the Honor Citizen application form and they can have it be mailed out to them or they can come into our Pioneer Courthouse Square location to fill it out. Um, they do need to verify their military status by showing um, either the CAC card for active duty military members, um, the uniform services ID card or driver's license that um, classifies them as a veteran or a copy of the DD-214. Um, and then once they have that, they can bring the either the completed application or they can show up, fill out the application, do the verification of ID, and then they would also get their card immediately there at Pioneer Courthouse Square. And again, that takes anywhere from five to 10 minutes. Um, the other option which we mentioned was um, based on age, based on disability, um, for based on disability, folks can also fill out an online application form, um, excuse me, a physical form because they have to get a, um, they have to get a doctor's um, signature as well on that. So they have to fill out that physical form. And again, they can have it be mailed out to them directly and we will send out that form, but they will need to get um, a healthcare provider to sign off on that form. Um, and they can bring out some of the other ways is to get the Social Security Administration to sign off. Um, basically, we need verification of that from, from an agency that can provide that documentation. Um, and again, similar to the veterans application, they would bring it to our uh, location at Pioneer Courthouse Square and they would get a picture taken and they would get a um, card that's personalized. Um, I wanted to highlight some of the ways in which folks can apply in person as well. The veterans um, program, as well as the disability program or eligibility based on disability can only be done at our um, Pioneer Courthouse Square location. Um, so they would have to come for, to that location. However, if you're applying based on um, an income, we have different partners that we work with throughout the metropolitan area where they can do a registration in person. 
Um, and currently we only have a few um, locations throughout and our team is also um, doing registrations in person, uh, different resource fairs or different um, locations where we are at in person. So our engagement team is doing that to try and, and be out and about in more locations than the ones listed here. So we have um, Portland State University does a, a lot of registrations for students, um, but pretty much anyone who is able to get there um, could could be there too because they are open to the general public. Um, we have the work source locations throughout metro um, throughout the metropolitan area. We also have the um, location over in Beaverton as well as the location in Tigard as one of as one of our partners. Um, there are other community-based organizations that are not listed here. And that's because they serve um, their own client base. So um, there is a list that I can send out to you um, all if you were interested in finding out which of our partners serve client-based only. Um, so I could do that. We don't promote it online just because um, they are only serving their own clients and they don't want to be overwhelmed by the general public. But if you have questions about who else is part of that list, I can send that over to you. We have about 110 different partner agencies that we work with um, throughout the three three um, counties, Multnomah County, Clackamas County, and Washington County. Um, if you wanted to find a list of the different locations that we are at, um, you can go to trimit.org forward slash save. And um, there is a list of different locations where my team, the community engagement team is at um, with the different times that we are available to do the uh, registrations. I will note that anyone who registers with my team currently will also get a seven day pass um, while they wait to get their personalized card um, via mail. So if they are needing something right away, um, but are hesitant because they won't get the card uh, right away, they can come and get registered at one of those um, locations that we will be at and they will get a seven day pass um, that they can utilize while they wait for the personalized card to arrive. Um, and we will be doing that through the end of February. I wanted to highlight some of the ways that you can get a hold of us. Of course, um, email, text, um, you can call customer service. We know that there are a lot of questions, not just about fares, but also about safety. And we want to um, highlight that we are available via phone, via text messages. If people want to text something, if they see something that they don't necessarily think is an emergency, but want to let us know, we want to hear about our writers and we want to see what they're seeing on the system so that we can address what's going on. Um, a lot of folks like to text, so that's an option. Um, but you know, if you also want to wait and send us an email, that's also great. Um, and of course, if there's an emergency, we always ask that you call 911. Um, but we are here and I can drop my email as well in the chat box so that if you have questions, you can reach out to me directly. And I will stop for questions. Awesome. Any questions for Amparo? Okay. All right. I think Layla's question might have been answered. Layla, let me, let's see. Any recommendation for those that are homeless? Um, we have our customer, um, our customer response team, that, that's a new team that was um, implemented during the pandemic. And they are really there to connect with our writers and specifically writers who um, don't have a destination that they are getting to. So if they need assistance finding a shelter or even calling other services like 211 or 311, um, they also have direct contact with a lot of the shelters in Portland so that they are aware how how many um, beds are available or what type of services um, they can access. I would definitely recommend, um, you know, if you have questions about that program, we can do a presentation and talk about all of the various different um, initiatives that we have currently 
uh, TriMet to try and help as many folks that we that we know are on the system without a destination. Um, but our our most um, helpful team is the customer um, support team, which is on the system, and they are in instances doing a warm. Um, transfer to to a, a social service agency. You know they're um, providing socks. They're providing sometimes snacks, things like that. Um, in terms of the hop cards, they um, can apply as well to to do um, to do it based on income or based on age or based on a disability, it is increasingly difficult for us to try and register them unless they come to the customer um, customer service office downtown because then they can get it there. Um, we have some attestations that some um, CBOs can do when it comes to like the income because that's one of the um, one of the items that they come across is um, you know income they don't really have that information um, so we have attestations now that the community based organizations can fill out and they can attest to say we we provide services to this individual and they don't have income or something along those lines and they can use that as the income requirement we do need to verify their identity so that is still something that we need um, for them to provide is some type of form of um, verification in in addition to IDs, um, some agencies in the past were able to provide some type of identification um, for that person that they that they provided services to. We're not seeing that as, as much anymore, but um, we can definitely try and see if that's something that you're running across um, when it comes to providing ID. I hope that answers your question, Layla. I think it did. She said, thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. And it looks like you put your uh, email in the chat. Thank you so much. If there are any follow-up questions, um, is it okay for folks to email you directly? Of okay. course. Yes. Um, right. Send me an email. And of course, if you have events that you want us to, to be present at, my team would love to just be there and provide information, or if you think it would be um, helpful for us to come out and do registrations for the various events that you have. Um, Annie, we appreciate the invitation to join as many of, of those events that you put together. It's been really great to be in attendance, but um, we also know that we need to create more partnerships in Clackamas County, especially as one of the areas where uh, we are really looking forward to doing uh, more outreach. I have some contacts in Clackamas that I can potentially help you with too. Thank you, Annie. I appreciate it. You bet. You bet. Thank you so much. This is super important information. And I know right now there's a lot going on uh, just with free rides um, and staying warm and rides to shelters. And so I know it's a busy time. So thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, we will continue with the uh, Water Bureau. We have Matt Weatherly, Penny Milton, and Kenny Scott on to speak about a variety of things. Um, and I will let all of you kind of figure out who's going to go first and, and what you're going to talk about. So thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you. Um, and ap my apologies, because uh, just like everyone else, I have a two-year-old here that got uh, his daycare is closed because of the ice. So you might hear some baby talk and maybe some screaming, but it's all in good fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, my name is Kenny Scott. I am the uh, financial assistance program manager here at the Port and Water Bureau. And um, the one thing about what we feel here at the Port and Water Bureau is water is, um, it is a human right. Essentially, we want to approach the affordability crisis like it is a wraparound service. Um, we do understand that water is expensive. Um, rates are going up. Uh, people's income is not going up, but they still um, have to pay these these water bills. And so we understand that affordability can be can be an issue. And we want to tackle that not only by um, the cost of water itself, but also how affordable 
um, how the affordability of water can be a wraparound service. Um, so we do understand that since it is a human right and the most basic essential life provision, it is not free. Um, we do have to pay for the storage and treatment of water as well as the maintenance of the water infrastructure and things being said. Um, next slide, please. Um, so coming from that aspect, we do understand that a lot of our customers and, and your clients cannot afford to pay the water bill to begin with. Um, that is something that we're looking at um, daily, honestly. We, we service about 8,900 folks in our water uh, program, but you know every single person in the Portland area is receiving Portland water. So we know that we can do better than that. And we are looking at ways to, um, to improve that. So some of the things that we've done is um, extended the temporary shutoff uh, in protection for multifamily tenants who are impacted by the increasing utility costs and the failure of a landlord to pay the utility bill. Um, that actually is a new program that we have called RAMP. The RAMP program is a multifamily program that if a property owner is a nonprofit and their building is um, income restricted, they do have the opportunity to apply for this program and get receive a discount in hopes that the landlord in turn does not raise the um, raise the customer's rent um, or does some sort of improvement to the infrastructure of the apartment building. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so just like I said, so 95,000 Portlanders are living in poverty and receiving rental or public assistance in some form. And with that, about 11,500 of them are eligible for water disconnection anytime during the year, which is, um, which is a lot. And just like I said, we only are servicing about 9,000 of those folks. So we have some work to do there. These are some of the areas where we do offer some help right now. Um, our bill discount program, we have two tiers and if, folks do qualify by their income, they're able to receive a discount quarterly on their water bill, up to 80%, um, which is pretty significant. We are looking at some ways to take it a step further and not just look at, are they income, is their income qualifying them, but are other factors contributing to them living in poverty or being income restricted? Um, and so we are going to take some measures to the council here within the next month to look at how can we holistically look at folks and not have to have them apply for the discount, but to see if there's other ways that we can determine that they qualify for a water discount on their bill. Um, but that is something that is, is in the pilot stage as of right now. So hopefully we can get that pushed through. Um, right now, if you do qualify for our program, you're eligible for a $500 crisis voucher once a year. That $500 crisis voucher can go directly to your balance. A lot of times that gets folks out of having um, you know, a thousand dollar bill, you take the $500 plus if they have a hundred dollars, whatever the case may be, and bring their balance down quite a bit. And then we also look at doing long-term payment arrangements to make sure that the water is, that the bill is lower. And then on top of that, discounting their bill down, just like I said, up to 80% um, going forward. Um, we also have our leak and fixture repair uh, program, which I'm sure Penny will talk about here shortly. Um, and our Clean Rivers Reward Program, which discounts down the stormwater charge on the bill. If you've ever seen your water bill, you see that you're getting two charges. You're getting a charge for water, and then you're also getting a charge for stormwater. Um, the stormwater charge is coming from uh, Bureau of Environmental Services. Um, we manage that for them, um, but that is, that's another charge that is on top of the water bill. But the bill discount will discount the entire uh, portion there. Next slide, please. Sorry, this is me. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Penny Milton. I work with Kenny at the Water Bureau, um, and I coordinate our water leak repair program. So as Kenny talked about, if someone qualifies for the bill discount, um, then they're pre-qualified for leak repair. They just need to be the homeowner and have a fresh water leak. So we can't do sewer uh, leaks or clogs right now. Um, and we do prioritize based on the, the largest leaks. So um, 
if there if it's like a 3000 gallon gallon leak like that's going to go ahead of a dripping faucet always with our program um, we can also replace inefficient toilets and washing machines so if you're working with folks who might benefit from this we just want you to know that that program exists and i'm ha happy to ask, answer any other questions about it um, at the end and i'll hand it back to you kenny and then these are our income guidelines or what we're looking at. And this is um, AMI. This is pretty general um, around as far as what it would take to qualify income-based for the program. Like I said, right now, the way that the income base is, is set up, some folks don't qualify by making $100 more a year. Um, and that's just not sufficient. We're, we're coming up with ways to, to rectify that. Um, so that we can look at the picture holistically and say, hey, this person may make more than it says, um, you know, by $100, but they have this much more debt because of some systemic things that they're facing in their life. Um, and so those are some things that we are working on right now. Um, next page, Penny. So with that being said, uh, some of the ways that we have uh, looked at ways to address the issues are by our basic financial assistance program. Actually, um, since we've made this, we're up, up to about 8,700 um, customers that we're serving, our Clean Rivers Reward pro Program, and then our uh, payment plans that are interest-free. Another thing that um, we have also put into, uh, into place, which has increased our numbers of folks that we're serving, is categorical eligibility. So not just looking at the income and going through and trying to verify that if there are certain things that trigger, we will go ahead and automatically qualify you for the program. If you have TANF, um, if you're receiving supplemental social security, um, getting food stamps um, or in, on some other type of low income federal programs, we will go ahead and automatically um, enroll you into the financial assistance program at the Water Bureau. Hey. Uh, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, and so this Penny again, my kiddo's also home and in this room, so um, I just wanted to let everyone know that we do have free conservation devices, so the Water Bureau gives out shower heads, um, faucet aerators, leak detection tablets, all for free. If you are an organization that has an ability to um, distribute those to folks in the community, let me know. We can get you a bulk amount, um, but they can always contact us directly and order online or by phone. And um, that can really help reduce someone's water bill just because they're going to be using less water overall. Usually like with faucets, for example, it's going to cut it by about half. Um, and then, well, depending on what their original faucet flow was, but it usually goes from like 2.2 to one gallons per minute. Um, we also have a number of rebates. So these are incentives to be able to help folks replace inefficient fixtures like toilets, um, irrigation controllers, ice machines if you happen to work with restaurants, things like that. Just know they exist and they're all available online. And then I wanna switch gears into uh, water quality information. So I do not work in water quality. Our colleague, Matt Weatherly, um, typically does this part, but I'm going to share some general information and then happy to get you in touch with Matt if you have more specific questions. But overall, if you ever encounter folks or if you yourself have questions about water quality, like if your water looks um, brownish or if it, you know, has a weird smell or something, or if you don't have water, I mean, typically like we do a really great job of getting, you know, clean, great water to people. And like sometimes there are times where there's maintenance happening and you might be getting some impact from that. So we have a water quality line, um, interpretations available and um, our staff are uh, able to speak directly in Spanish as well. So just know that that exists and we'd love to have folks contact us if you have questions about water quality information. Um, and over the years, there have been um, questions and concerns about lead in water. So I just wanna kind of highlight for Portland specifically, the, the main concerns with lead and water are about home plumbing. So especially in the late, if your home was built in the late 70s or early 80s, you may have lead solder or lead components in your home, and that can pick up 
um, lead in the water and essentially um, raise it to a level that would be unsafe or could be unsafe. So you can have that water test. You can have your water tested for free. We just want folks to know about it. This picture is showing that um, it kind of shows where your responsibility starts in within the home um, and that the the pieces of our system that we knew may have con uh, may have contained lead have been removed. And, and luckily, like Portland never had service lines that were made out of lead like other parts of the country. So um, that piece wasn't as much of an issue, but it can still be an issue in people's homes. So we want to just make sure they have the information they need. Um, of course, lead is an issue, especially for kiddos. Um, it can really affect overall, you know, development and all kinds of things. Um, so we want to make sure we catch it if there is an issue in the home. And um, so that brings us to just making sure that it's tested. So if you have your water tested and you find that there are higher results, our teams will work with you. I mean, there are simple things that you can do, like running your water for a couple minutes, um, you know, in the mornings to kind of flush through that water that's been sitting in your pipes all night, things like that. Um, but that first step is really having the information, testing your water, and understanding if there's any kind of risk in your particular home plumbing. Um, yeah, and we'll work directly, like I said, like if folks have elevated lead levels in their water, um, we do work and provide support with them and have that, them take action, and then we'll retest and, and provide some technical support. So we just want, want everybody to be aware of that. Um, and I did want to just mention that we do community workshops on um, a lot of different things, but typically we're talking about, you know, easy ways to save water, how to fix common toilet leaks, which is fun. We have a little demonstration toilet that we can actually flush and check out how to, you know, fix the chain, fix the flapper. We'll talk about financial assistance and water quality and pressure, uh, go much more into depth on what folks can take care of within their own home. And then we always like to talk about like, Right now, storing water for an emergency. We actually had a pipe break in our home this weekend and, you know, needed to have water for flushing toilets and things like that. So it's always good to have emergency water stored. Recommend seven uh, gallons per person per day, or sorry, a gallon per person per day for two weeks. So 14 gallons per person. And then don't forget your pets. So, um, yeah, I think that is our last slide. We're happy to answer any questions or let us know. And I'll put some links in the chat too to the different programs that I mentioned. Any questions? Awesome. I love how timely <laughs> all of this is. It is so important. Thank you both so much. I know that you're juggling a lot, both personally and professionally. So thank you both for for uh, creating time to be here with us today and share this information. And just with all of these government programs, city programs, um, I know that it takes so much time to make change, especially in government, but just watching and having had these presentations over the last you know, five years or so, watching um, the programs evolve and really um, each of you being an active part in pushing change internally. I just want to acknowledge that and thank all of you for the work that you're doing because I've worked in government and I know it doesn't move fast and that can be really challenging, but I just really want to give you all a shout out because um, it can get tough sometimes, but you're doing great work and we just appreciate the changes and the accessibility and the language um, interpretation that's available um, and uh, just the low income opportunities or, or um, lower wage earner opportunities um, and just the accessibility. So thank you so much for all that you do. I really just wanted to say that. So, um, and Andy, if can I have one more thing? But, absolutely. Um, so just because we're in this moment of freeze, if you do have folks that have pipes break um, over the next week, um, just like know that the water leak repair program exists. We do still have funding. It's exactly what it's there for. You know, even if you're unsure if someone might qualify, call the water bureau and ask for the water leak repair program. And um, we have, so we send licensed plumbers out to actually do that work. We can replace full service lines. Um, this is, yeah, we have about $60,000 left and we will hopefully all things go well, be getting a lot more funding starting 
in July, which I know is a long time away, but um, things are, are moving in a good direction. Thank you. Thank you, Penny. And they just call the Water Bureau directly and ask for a leak repair? Yeah, I'll put um I'll put our direct number for the program in. You can always just call the general customer service line, um, but I'll I'll write in the program number so you can talk with um, my colleague Nick, who does the intake for our program. Perfect. Thank you. Very, very much. Any questions for any of our presenters for the Water Bureau, for any of the other presenters? Okay. Thank you all so much for sharing such important information. And if you um, have the opportunity and are okay to share your slide deck with me afterwards, um, I would love to share that with those who attended and those maybe who couldn't um, so that we can kind of get them the information. And I will, yes, I always send out a follow-up email. So on Friday, you will get all of this information in the CSN uh, weekly email, the newsletter. So that will be in there. Um, any other questions or updates or anything that anyone would like to share before we wrap up today? Okay, awesome. Well, I just wanted to let you know that tomorrow our Washington County Thrives event will be virtual. We've moved that to virtual, so it will not be at the Village Church. It will be virtual. If you're having a hard time finding that Zoom link, please email me and I will get that to you. We are still hosting a fair on Saturday. I know there's a couple events, actually. If you check out the, the email on Friday that comes out, there are a couple of resource fairs on Saturday, January 20th. So please make sure to share those. And if you have any upcoming events or anything you'd like to share, don't hesitate to get that information to me by Thursday at noon, and I'd be happy to share that in our newsletter. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks to our presenters. Have a lovely day. Stay warm, stay safe. And thanks for all that you do uh, day in and day out. We appreciate you. Have thanks. a great day.